Welcome to our second panel of our national conference. My name is Emma Reynolds. I'm the Managing Director of Public Affairs, Policy and Research at the City UK. A warm welcome to everybody who's joined us and a big thank you to our panel who I will introduce in a moment. The focus of this second panel is on the role of our industry, the financial services and related professional services industry in supporting the economic recovery. As Sir Adrian Montague said in his opening remarks this morning, our industry has always already been at the forefront of helping people with the economic fallout of this awful pandemic. And we stand ready to be part of the solution to this crisis. 2.3 million people are employed in our industry, two thirds of whom are based outside of London. And the key questions that our panel are going to consider today are what can we do to work in partnership with national and local governments across the country to support the recovery? And how will our industry support a more inclusive and sustainable recovery? And how can we help the government in delivering its levelling up agenda? We have a stellar panel joining us to consider these questions. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Darko um, Hadutrovic from the uh, London Stock Exchange Group, Catherine McGuinness from the City of London Corporation, Henry Morrison from the Northern Powerhouse Partnership, and Claire Tunley from the Financial Services Skills Commission. Each will give their opening remarks at the top of this discussion, but please, I would encourage people um, who are joining us uh, through their Zoom to put in the Q&A any questions that you have for our August panel. Thanks again, and without further ado, over to you, Darko. Thank you, Emma. And I'm delighted to, um, to be at this panel and, and at this event, and also to talk about how can uh, the financial industry support uh, the economy uh, at this, um, at this, uh, during this volatile time and um, and the crisis, which which has which has which has been ta taken uh, uh, better part of, part of 2020. So, I suppose to start with, I just wanted to perhaps frame the size of the problem. And if we just look at uh, how many businesses are affected in what way, we're talking about uh, uh, we're talking about uh, 100 billion of potentially unsustainable debt that has been taken on by businesses. And this is actually from the City UK own report. Um, and we're talking about the financing gap that was before the financial crisis running at five to 10 billion uh, sterling a year, as, 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 um, as uh, reported in the uh, Scale Up Institute report. Now it's, now it's uh, at uh, 15 billion uh, a year. So the balance sheets of the companies have been severe, severely affected, irrespective of whether they're going to get the vaccine or not. Hopefully that will happen very, very soon, as, 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 as we've seen recently. But irrespective of what happens, the industry is affected, the balance sheets are affected, and the, uh, the debt, as many companies have taken on debt, which um, may or may not be unsustainable, uh, but certainly is not something that they were factoring in at the beginning of 2020. So how can the industry, how can our industry help? Uh, that's, uh, that's a question that is looking at the core of what we do as an, as an industry. We are facilitating flow of capital to where that capital is needed. And, and at the stock exchange, what we are concerned about is making sure that that flow is as efficient as possible and uh, is as rapid as possible. So saving those viable businesses that uh, either uh, are uh, struggling now or are struggling to get financing to adjust to a new a new normal whatever that normal may be uh, is, is 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 should be an absolute priority and can be a concentrated effort that many segments of the uh, of the economy uh, many, many segments of our industry can help. And let me just, find a, uh, just uh, finish on, on one final point. Before we went into 2020, uh, we were talking about the ESG, inclusivity, diversity, leveling up. And all of these are actually instruments that, we, that the industry should use when it comes to building back, better building up to the new, uh, the, the, that, that new normal. And I'm sure we're gonna come back to that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Darko, for your opening remarks. Um, please, over to you, Catherine. 
Thank you very much, Emma, and thank you very much for inviting me to be on this panel. And as you've heard, I'm from the City of London Corporation. For those who don't know us, we look after the Square Mile uh, itself, the uh, the heart of uh, London, after which our financial and professional services sector is colloquially named the City. And I think we've seen over recent months the exceptional resilience of uh, the financial and professional services sector in meeting uh, the challenges of this pandemic, adapting very quickly to remote working, playing a vital part in the wider response, uh, getting out some of that government uh, support, um, you know, innovating in the way that uh, in the way that it operates, uh, making innovations in methods of payment and insurance products. And as we look to recovery, the sector is going to have an equally important role to play. Darko's talked about its role in ensuring the flow of capital. It's uh, similarly, it's going to be a driver of prosperity in uh, continuing to generate jobs and those all important tax receipts uh, and continue as a cornerstone of the economy, you know, providing practical support to households and businesses alike. And I think, Emma, I, I very much look forward to seeing the City UK report when it comes out, um, uh, uh, setting out ideas for empowering the sector and recommendations to draw on and ensure that the sector can play its part to the full. And we're uh, working very closely with City UK to deliver uh, uh, shared ambitions in this space, including supporting City UK on that very important work on recapitalisation. And despite the fact that we're the uh, governing body for, the, we're the local authority for the square mile in the heart of uh, London, we're also looking beyond London, working with the sector across the UK to support regional economies, sharing and learning from each other. And we recently published a report, which may not reflect that in its title. Its title is uh, London Recharged. Uh, it's a, um, a study that we did to try to develop some practical suggestions for what should be done uh, to ensure that we come out of this crisis uh, as strong, if not stronger, than we went into it. It does demonstrate that London has a big role to play in supporting the recovery across the whole of the uh, UK, because London's success is a driver for success uh, countrywide. But it also provides wide ranging recommendations on how the sector can remain uh, world leading, how we can continue to attract business and talent from across the globe, and how London can share its success across the UK. We highlight an ongoing commitment to openness uh, and the importance of providing the best possible ecosystem for collaboration and innovation, and of course, the importance of supporting digital transformation to build resilience and opportunity. Resilience and opportunity in the SME sector uh, uh, and the, you know, with innovative businesses as well uh, as uh, uh, larger ones. Emma, you've already spoken about the number of jobs uh, in the sector that are outside uh, uh, London. Um, it is vital that we continue to nurture the sector across the UK. I'm a great believer in cakeism, not the sort of cakeism we've heard too much about during the last couple of years, but I'm a great believer in growing the size of the cake nationwide so we can all uh, take a bigger slice rather than, uh, as the levelling up agenda sometimes suggests, uh, growing some areas at the expense of others. So we work very closely with partners across the UK. We try to use our expertise, networks and resources, particularly on topics such as green finance, uh, uh, fintech, uh, trade and investment. Um, our Lord Mayor, who, who uh, carries out uh, a, um, a busy programme of overseas engagement, promoting uh, the financial and professional services sector, uh, regularly um, talks about the importance of the sector UK-wide. We try to ensure that the um, uh, the pockets of uh, absolute expertise and uh, cutting edge uh, that we see around the country in, in this sector are um, you know, are promoted as much as uh, London. And I would say that it's clear from our discussions that there are shared priorities across the country, priorities in which financial and professional services can play a, an integral part, and that it's really essential that, uh, as you've said, that we work together. We work together in partnership to ensure that business is supported, that we identify the skills needs of our future workforce as we look at the changed world in which we're working, and that we work together to attract uh, investment, help to create uh, jobs and build a strong uh, green economy. And, uh, 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 and really to make sure that, that we continue to make the case for the whole of the UK as a great place to do business, ensuring from our perspective that London realises its potential to support the recovery across the UK. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.
Um, many thanks, Catherine, and I, I totally agree with your comments about um, making sure that the cake is bigger for everybody rather than playing one part of the country up against uh, another. Thanks so much. And um, on, on that note, um, over to Henry at the Northern Powerhouse Partnership, please. So now I think I, th I think I, I follow very much in the same spirit, right, which is that um, the reality of the Northern Powerhouse kind of ambition was never about simply shifting existing economic activity away from London the South East. And uh, I agree with some of the critique of the levelling up narrative in the way that it's been developed by some in government. I mean, it, it's been stretched in the last few weeks to cover potholes. So I think as a narrative, it, it probably is open to abuse, but it, re it, it stands in, in the context of the government's ongoing commitments to the Northern Powerhouse, which is about transformational economic rebalancing. And you only achieve that by rising productivity in the north of England, not by simply moving economic activity, because the real disjuncture between north and south is not actually in the sectors we have. We do have a very lively and successful uh, financial and professional services industry that I worked in uh, for Yorkshire Building Society for a number of years here in West Yorkshire before I came to this job. And so it isn't a disjuncture in economic interests, it's a disjuncture in levels of productivity. And the role of uh, the financial services sector in particular is, of course, to play a role in helping to address that productivity challenge. And I absolutely believe that the way in which we use our financial firepower in this country to enable us to be more productive is key. And uh, our, ch our vice chair, Lord Jim O'Neill, has uh, said some very, uh, I suppose, uh, sort of bold things about the need perhaps alongside recapitalization to also focus on accessing more patient capital, particularly in the space of decarbonisation and in parts of the country that may be more economically disadvantaged in terms of their historical performance, but where there is strong potential for rebounding. And I think that what you see in terms of the economic proposition of the Northern Powerhouse is although that financial and professional services is a key enabler, that's about enabling the economy, the real economy, as I would refer to it, that's not a criticism of those enablers, but manufacturing, energy, health, innovation and digital, which make up 25% of the North's uh, jobs, but drive a lot more of its economic activity, because they're the productive activities that are supported by universities, logistics, uh, and financial and professional services that are key enablers. And you do almost have to go back to first principles, I think, when we start to talk about the economic recovery, to not forget everything we knew about economic development before the crisis, because in reality, the same challenges of low productivity are still our fundamental problem. The reality, the challenge is that we have to do it more quickly now, because we have an unemployment crisis approaching. And that unemployment crisis, along with some of our other economic woes, requires us to think very seriously about what types of economic activity we want to intervene in the economy to stimulate, uh, whether that be private sector intervention or by the state, nationally or, or regionally. And that means we need to not put our eggs in the basket of recreating our problematic economic model from before the crisis, and instead focus on things that we could do better. And I think if building back better <coughs> means a different type of economic recovery to the type of economy we had before the crisis and that would be a very sensible way of approaching the problem and I think very practically last night alongside saying some things about Scotland that perhaps the Prime Minister regrets he also promised to the Northern Research Group of MPs that there would be a Northern Economic Recovery Plan as part of the government's response to this crisis and the reason why I believe that's important and why we believe that should be led by our Metro Mayors is that our Chair George Osborne has been uh, very vociferous in making the case for the role of the devolved mayors he created in driving forward the economic recovery in our city regions. In the same way, I believe the City of London Corporation has a critical role in helping to drive the role of the financial professional services firms in the recovery. I think in our places outside of London, the South East, we need the firepower from our metro mayors to spend whatever limited resources there are as effectively as possible. And I think that this is the the real crux of the devolution discussion, which I think does unite very much the geography of London and Greater London with that of the North of England, which is that obviously the, the Petri dish for powerful city region mayors was in London. And of course, uh, the Prime Minister uh, is in that lineage. And I think that uh, we cannot let the Prime Minister forget uh, that he and Eddie Lister is, is now Chief of Staff, uh, uh, very much in a transitional role, but doing great work, I know, to try and keep uh, our community safe, but also our economies protected and has done a, been a great uh, conduit for some of the very challenging conversations that have been had with Whitehall by our city regions in the last few months, which would have been a lot worse without him there. 
that what they did in London and the successes they had in London can be recreated in other parts of the country. I and mean, whether it's in Greater Manchester, where this event has taken place in the past at uh, some of the uh, the offices of, of London-based firms uh, and international firms that have a significant presence in Manchester and that Manchester relies on, in, including uh, BMI Mellon, for instance. These are critical parts of our national economic infrastructure. And what we cannot do is presuppose that a recovery that benefits only part of the country will be in the sustainable interests of this industry in particular, because there is a symbiotic relationship between the prospects for financial professional services and where its employees live. And its employees in the balance do not live and work in London. They live and work in the regions of the UK. And I think how we ensure that the recovery we have is a broad based one geographically and sectorally is absolutely vital, Emma. And it's why as a partnership, we're delighted to include many of the larger financial institutions amongst our members. So HSBC with first directed leads and many other roles. Uh, Barclays has significant presence across the North, including in Manchester, its technical expertise and some of its global functions in, in Cheshire. And organisations like CYBG based predominantly out of Newcastle and Scotland and with big presence in Chester, for instance. So we're very much uh, based on a, a number of financial services firms as an organisation who see the, the importance of their sector to the North of England and I think that the sector has a huge role to play in economic rebalancing, but very much we must, we must continue baking the cake that rises greater, as has been said before, not simply getting out smaller and smaller slices. Uh, and I think that, the, that certainly in industry, I perceive, and in our city regions and with the London mayoralty at no division there, I think there is a different view in parts of Whitehall and parts of Parliament and those who take a different view need to move on and realise that that is not a sustainable economic strategy for the UK, nor for the places themselves, which will continue to have large inequalities and very significant drags of the social ills that come from very large numbers of disadvantaged people, unless they can start to pay their way. And that fiscal deficit is absolutely something we have to address, because those taxes that are paid in London, some of it earned income from uh, the regional operations of banks, we should be getting more of our taxation base from outside of London, the South East. And that's something that certainly the Northern Powerhouse wants to do something about, uh, because it is inherently not in the interest of those places, as well as not being in the UK national interest to only depend on one square mile, in, in much ways far too dependent for our tax base. And I think the sector has a huge role in addressing that, that issue not just uh, in being beneficiaries, hopefully, from not having to carry that burden alone in the future. Thank you uh, so much, Henry. Um, over to our uh, last panellist, Claire. Last but no means least, uh, look forward to your um, reflections from the Financial Services Skills Commission. Over to you, Claire. Thanks, Emma, and thank you for inviting me to join this panel. Um, so I'm the, the Chief Executive of the Financial Services Skills Commission, which is a new organisation um, representing the, the sector in the UK on skills. So we represent um, our members who are um, large financial services firms, industry bodies, but we also have smaller firms, including a, a fintech that has half its operations in Preston, for example. So we do have a, a good UK coverage. Um, and I think the, the just talking about skills, Darko talked about flow of capital and I'm, I'm going to talk about the flow of people and skills and the people firepower um, that, that Henry's mentioned. Um, skills is a challenge for the UK's uh, financial services sector. And, and I must say that I'm work, I work closely with the professional services sector as well, even though we represent financial services. And a lot of the issues are common between the two, the two sectors. Um, we, we had a skills gap before the pandemic came along um, and much of what's happened in the last uh, six to eight months has, has just accelerated some of those challenges, increased digitization, um, the, the supply of people with the right skills and, and as we see you know products and services continue, you know, being digitized and automated to a greater extent in the last six months or so and the move to nearly 100% remote working has really just accelerated some of those challenges that we identified um, back in January when the, the Financial Services Skills Task Force published its report um, 
And I think the, the last, uh, you know, how many months have been quite a, a, a challenge, but our research shows that the sector has responded very well to the, the changes. Um, there has been a very rapid redeployment of staff to service new ways of working, to, to meet new um, ways of engaging with customers. Um, Four percent of the, the industry has been furloughed, which is one of the lowest um, sort of numbers of any sector. Um, and we've seen, you know, that the industry take on big challenges such as business interruption loads and really shift focus to service those new things very rapidly. And the research that we undertook um, and published last month shows that's that's been a real positive for the sector. Um, and but it's also thrown up new challenges as well. So increased need to train and digitize um, our processes, but people to, to, to manage that and service that, but also challenges around management and leadership. And what we've also heard is increasing demands for training around empathy, uh, relationship management, well-being of staff, customers um, and individuals themselves. Um, so there's, there's a whole scale shift and the, the, the way that we've changed our working practices um, has, you know, we don't know where that's going to settle long term, but we do know that half of the industry wants to work more flexibly after the pandemic is all over and there's some sort of normal, whatever that means, um, to come back to. Um, but then there's also a lot of people who, who don't want to do that. And I think that's, a, that's an ongoing challenge for, for employers to think about what physical location they have for their staff you know what does it mean if we have all the jobs are they in London and if people are working remotely and they're based in Lincolnshire for example then that sort of movement and that geographic boundaries and constraints of work can uh, now move you know open up and provides a massive opportunity to, to build and draw on talent from a much greater um, geographical base um, so I think some of that still hasn't quite quite bedded in yet but I think there's a, there's a huge opportunity there for the future um, and how we can embed those good things that we've, we've developed virtual internships online learning and that increased flexibility to attract talent are real positives that we can you know take from this mass experiment that no one no one planned for but we've all gone along with um, but then we have got challenges still of how we build culture in, in work in our work how we build our teams um, and you know some of the challenges that Henry's outlined of, of making sure that this is a growth across the UK and and, and you know Catherine's point about growing that the productivity for the whole of the UK not at one region at the expense of the other or one nation at the expense of another and I think some of the the reflections from the work we're doing at the, the commission um, is really around three areas and it's it's around retaining the talent we have it's much easier to uh, invest in the people that are already in the industry rather than look to recruit all the time and, and our work shows that that's actually where the focus needs to be um, so the second area is around retraining so if we retain people we need to retrain and upskill them into the areas where we're seeing critical skill shortages um, and they are industry-wide they're around tech and digitization but for our work at the Commission, it's around building on the existing knowledge and capability that we have in the sector and enhancing that because the, the future skills need the sector, what employers are telling us is it's a blended professional, someone that understands financial services, understands digital and technological potential and, and capabilities, but underpinned by a lot of human skills, creativity, critical thinking, empathy. And that's what we're working towards. And, and we can achieve that by investing in our, in our um, existing workforce across the whole of the UK. Um, and the final area is, is protecting that pipeline. Uh, we have a really strong pipeline of talent into the industry at all levels, but very much at early career as well, um, in particular. And how do we make sure that we protect that pipeline for the future? And this is critical for um, some of the programmes around uh, diversity and inclusion, social mobility, for example, that do have real impact across the UK. So that's some of the work we're, we're looking at. Um, we're, we're developing a skills framework with our members to, to define what those future skills are and how that relates to job functions within the industry. Um, and working with the City Corporation and City UK and others and, and Bays, we're just um, about to start some research on the skills needs across our regions and nations for financial and professional services looking at that in more detail of where those skill needs exist um, and what we need to do about them and I think it's worth saying some of our, our early work has identified that in the sector around a quarter of the sector have very low levels of qualification no higher than a GCSE so there's huge potential to boost the qualifications and, and the skill levels of our workforce um, whilst also boosting our product, productivity and innovation if we, we all sort of push it in the right direction um, and I say I'm, I'm thrilled that, that the commission is, is part of the City UK report um, that's coming out next year that Emma's mentioned as well so I'll leave it there for now but more happy to take questions
Thank you so much. And, and we very much look forward to reflecting on the discussion that we've had today and some of the other insights that members have provided us uh, to our report um, in the new year on the role of our industry in supporting the economic recovery. Um, I would encourage uh, those of you uh, watching uh, to pop any questions you have in the Q&A, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'll, I'll kick off with, uh, with a, a general question, which is this pandemic um, introduces and has accelerated many uh, changes uh, that, that some are already there, um, some have been um, introduced, the, the rise of remote working. Um, I mean, who would have thought that we could all be working from home full time uh, pretty effectively for such a long uh, period? But I wanted to ask, apart from the challenges that this pandemic has provoked, what our panellists think might be the opportunities uh, going forward in the new year when the recovery does start. Um, and maybe um, I could, if you don't mind, Catherine, uh, from the City of London Corporation, I could come to you first, because I think that was really the spirit of your London Recharge report. You were trying very much so to be forward looking and looking at some of the opportunities that are coming our way. Yes, thanks very much. That's absolutely right. It's looking at what we can do to invest in innovative sectors, to invest in innovative companies and create the right ecosystem for them to flourish and develop, to look at what we're doing around place so that they have the right workplaces in which to uh, base themselves and the right workplaces to take advantages of some of the changes we've seen in the way that people will be using um, offices. Uh, so it's a set of recommendations around five key themes, looking to the future, looking to take this opportunity uh, um, there's never a good crisis without a, a good opportunity, I suppose, um, and, you know, to use it as a catalyst for a change that maybe should have been happening or would have been happening at a slower, at a slower pace. So, yeah, we very much see this as uh, taking uh, um, the good, building on it and looking at where the competitive strengths of the country need to be for the future. And, and maybe Henry, could I, could I come to you next, and then I'll, I'll come to Darko. Um, the opportunities for for the work that you're doing, um, where do you think they they lie predominantly? So I think the kind of the decarbonisation space I think is is key to financial services and the current climate, but I think it's also key to the north as well. And I think where I would focus, I think, is the 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 switch we need to make in the nature of our economy, and we talk a lot about. The public investment that will be needed to facilitate that and the the benefits of uh doing that quicker uh, and spending money you're going to spend anyway but doing it earlier i think though for, for private investment and for our institutions uh, i think that there's just as big an opportunity to think about what the kind of the role coming up to the climate change summit next year what the role is for the private sector to change its approach and i i would certainly say that regardless of whether that's the businesses themselves in some of those sectors whether it be in energy or in in other industries that are being kind of transformed by what's going on at the moment and, and we saw the government's making a decision about for instance about carbon capture and storage which is transformational really actually for being able to move towards a hydrogen economy for instance that's a whole industry we didn't know anything about and certainly haven't got any commitment to build in the uk a few years ago and and when, when people were talking about clean coal at Drax Power Station, the, the then government wasn't very interested a few years ago. It is now. And I think that that, that change in economic model is happening very quickly uh, at the moment. And I think that was happening regardless of whether the government was actually going to get involved. But I think certainly maximising those opportunities and ensuring that you can uh, get on with supplying the UK's future, right, that we need to be in, in that space very much the way that the city takes that role to lead that agenda for the country and that benefits the whole of the UK. I think around energy we can make a similar point ourselves uh, in areas like that in in offshore wind and in, in parts of the nuclear industry like small modular reactors places like uh, the, the pro proposals for a, a large plant in Wilford right Welsh people and northerners aren't the only people who turn their lights on right so the same way that the north of England always powered the country electricity wise that will probably continue in the future right so the same way that financial services needs to show leadership in its own industry and that's in the national interest i think many of the things that will make the north more prosperous that will en enable us to have global strengths that we can export are not only going to require 
uh, private investment and the involvement of the advisory community very centrally to those deals and to some of the financing of them. But there is also a point about that distributed leadership in the UK, which is that the same way that intellectually and uh, kind of institutionally, the, the City of London provides that for the whole country, the North will seek to do that as well. And it's not just for our benefit, Emma, it's for the benefit of the UK, whether that's very directly for consumers, the same way that the banks benefit their customers, right, by enabling them to, to do their day to day work and jobs. There is also a point about that national economic interest, which is that that you do need to have a country that does these things, right, that is ready for the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth industrial revolution has a huge role to play in financial services, but it also has a huge role to play in the rest of the economy. And, and London, the South East is not going to discharge that function for the rest of the economy. And if you want enablers like financial professional services to be successful, they need the rest of the UK PLC economy to be world leading and world class. And at the moment, I don't think that's necessarily true. I don't think it's easy to say that the North or any part of the country is providing international or global leadership in some of these transformational parts of the economy beyond financial professional services. And that's not sustainable for the sector because it needs to have customers who are doing well. And I think what we can probably offer uh, the FPS sector is a series of successful customers and sectors that perhaps today are underperforming or areas of previous strength, but actually in, in the future could have a much stronger uh, forward approach and would be able to uh, carry that greater tax burden, right, which we know at the moment disproportionately falls on this sector. And I think that is a that's a key part of being able to remain competitive and also have a decent economy in society, which is that you need to have a number of sectors that are world class, world leading in the UK. And some of those will be distributed outside of the southeast. And, and that's the key to how you do economic rebalancing whilst also enabling the sectors and the places that are already thriving to continue to be successful. Thank you so much, uh, Henry. Uh, Darko, from your perspective, what might be the main opportunities and, and are there any opportunities um, for a regulatory uh, change so that it can be adapted to create a pro-recovery investment friendly uh, environment to drive that the growth that we need? Yeah, sure. Look, uh, we, we, I think we're all talking about the same thing, only from a slightly uh, different uh, angle. Um, so I suppose what I, what I want to know, what we are very focused on at the stock exchange is uh, ensuring that there is that funding that goes to that product those productive uses, and and not only and you know, opportunities is 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 almost uh, a given. So uh, capital will pursue opportunities and and, and investment opportunities, but also taking a step back and looking at the more long term opportunities. I supporting companies that perhaps are not going to be. Uh, making use of this opportunity to grow immediately and have double digit growth next year because they're providing something that the um, this crisis has, uh, uh, has, 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 has has come up with but it's actually providing capital for those viable businesses that are uh, that are now in trouble but are, are are going to grow in the in the future what thing, once things go back to some kind of normal or a new normal but will still need a lot of the business and many of which the, uh, Henry was talking uh, uh, Henry was talking about and this is where we actually have seen the stock exchange and the public markets play a really important role over the last six months and or, or nine months now already both whether that is in in raising sustainable bonds that are going and towards pro, use 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 of um, uh, capital uh, process of capital go towards uh, financing uh, the the the, the, <clears throat> the mitigating the uh, consequences of COVID. Whether it's funds that are investing in infrastructure in renewable space that are providing that uh, that fun financing, many of which is actually uh, uh, in the north. In the north, um, but also fi facilitating finance towards uh, private and, and, and uh, sorry, small companies as well as private companies. But in a small company sector, we we've seen actually uh, about five billion raised over the last six months just for that sector in a, in, in a publicly listed uh, uh, format. So so what what I'm saying is that in in the public space, it uh, has really shown through when it comes when it comes when it comes to this crisis, because these companies had opportunities to raise capital in multiple ways, be that the 
in in the in the debt or uh, or equity and we are delighted that in terms of the regulatory uh, framework uh regular the fca and, and the government and indeed us as, as, as a regulator the stock exchange have provided that we need flexibility when it comes to um uh, when it comes to providing rules around working capital statements the laying of disclosure information which all facilitated increase which all facilitated uh, uh capital raising and and just to kind of answer the second part of your question about that is about the the, the regulation we we are very um we, we welcome very much the uh announcement on monday by the by the chancellor of looking at the uh regime such that uh, it can help companies uh, british companies raise capital here stay uh, listening on the news our markets uh to 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 continue continue growing i think there is always opportunity to look at um uh, uh, best practices ac across the world and apply them in London and indeed lead uh, lead the way on many of these uh, regulatory practices so that we actually do have a framework and a construct of our markets uh, uh, that, that that support God or rather I should say continue to have that that um, uh, that 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 construct and continue to uh, channel money towards um, towards um, uh, be that be, be that uh, companies private or public or indeed uh, in various infrastructure projects. Thank you so much, Darko. Um, Claire, in, in your opening remarks, you talked about um, perhaps the opportunity of um, widening the uh, skills pool. Um, could you say a little bit more about how perhaps the uh, inevitable rise of flexible working, even when we go back to some sort of uh, new normal, uh, might, um, might be an opportunity in the future? No, absolutely. And I think um, flexibility, not just in working, but in, in recruitment, in the, the pipeline of talent and how we sort of reach potential um, uh, new workers in the sector and how we train people. Um, there's been, you know, an enormous growth in the sort of online learning, 60% more online learning in the first quarter of, of 2020 than there was the previous year. It's, it's been a shift. So the, I think this is all about opportunity, but being careful managed by firms to make sure that that we've still supporting workers where necessary um, and I think we've already seen um, an increase in um, certainly we're doing you know remote recruiting virtual recruiting um, but also people deciding I'm going to move I'm going to work differently in the future and firms being supportive of that although there are sometimes some barriers if people want to work overseas uh, there's some legal legal barriers people have to be aware of um, so I think I think the potential is huge um, um, but I do kind of caution that with um, we're not going to be working at home forever. There's clearly many people in the sector who are desperate to get back to the office or some sort of, uh, you know, part time office working, part time home working. So there will still be some sort of need for us to be in a physical location. But I do think the the what firms are looking at, at the moment is how that looks and, and how that that is shaped. Do we have offices for the purpose of collaboration? And if that is the case, how is how often do you need to be there and how do we shape that that workplace? Um, what have we what have we lost? by the, the massive amount of home working, but what have we gained? Let's keep the good bits and let's address the, the things that haven't worked well. So I think there's, there's massive potential and, and certainly um, things that I think would have taken a long time to try. So you imagine doing a, a full, okay, everyone's gonna work flexibly and doing a consultation internally on that. You know, it would take forever, um, but we, we've managed to get there and all tried it out. Virtual internships, I think, are one of the things that firms have really found incredibly um, positive that they can still have this uh, its engagement and internship. But actually, the reach and the diversity of candidates that, that they can bring in has been increased massively um, and also the geographical spread. So I think in terms of the UK wide piece, there, there's been historically such a focus on London and the southeast, and this is now allowing us to, to move away from that while still um, being productive um, and, and operating effectively, uh, because we haven't seen a massive reduction in productivity as a result of, of the change in ways of working. Um, and you know, so there's reasons to, to say we can keep this, we can keep the good bits. Thanks so much, Claire. Um, Catherine, the City of London Corporation. Uh, held a groundbreaking event uh, last week uh, in which you had, you can tell us how many participants you attracted to the Green Horizon uh, Summit. Perhaps you could give us some, some reflections on the role uh, of our industry in making sure that um, the UK remains at the forefront of providing uh, green finance and working towards the overall strategy of, of net zero. 
Thank you very much. Yes, we had a really exciting conference last week, the Green Horizon Summit, where we had a stellar cast of speakers, including our Chancellor, but also uh, Christine Lagarde, um, uh, all sorts of people, uh, Bill Gates, Mark Carney, announcing a, a roadmap for the sector, which I think is a really important one. Um, we were astonished. We were expecting 3,000 people to attend. We had 30,000 and new um, endless um, social media hits. And I think it reflects the fact that this is a, a, a this a, you know, the focus on green finance. This is an issue issue whose time has absolutely come. And I think it really is an area where the sector can play a significant part in both uh, um, helping the whole country uh, in the recovery, meeting the challenge of climate change, which we really do need to meet, uh, but also um, building on our already strong um, expertise in, in this space. And COP26 gives us the ideal opportunity to look at this. I mean, we have, first of all, as I say, we've got the, the need to address climate challenge, which I think very few people would now uh, contradict. We've got the opportunity uh, that Henry's spoken a little bit about, the opportunity in physical projects, real projects, if you like, Henry, around the country that we could uh, um, uh, finance. But then we have this special expertise from the sector in advising in the way that uh, we can, um, uh, you know, in advising on the appropriate instruments uh, and we've got our world-class regulators who I think need to come into the into the frame in looking at the reporting requirements, how we measure uh, risk, how we ensure that when investors who have a great demand for this uh, space these days uh, will get the sort of returns that they're looking for. So I think there's a whole piece that where the sector can bring its expertise, uh, maintain our, um, uh, our competitiveness and build towards uh, COP26, which uh, being uh, in Glasgow will be a great opportunity to show the strengths from uh, 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 well from Scotland but also from across the UK uh, in this area. We're certainly working with Mark Carney towards that with the sector. Uh, we're very keen to explore also what can be done uh, looking at the UK's presidency of the G7 at the same time and I, I really think that the mantra build back better which can be a little bit uh, formulaic uh, is something that we should be uh, getting behind and looking at as we look at maintaining our, our competitiveness in this space. Very much welcome the Chancellor's announcements last week about the first guilt about the uh, taxonomy and uh, also you know the, the emphasis he will be putting on this too. Wonderful. Thanks. So many thanks. Um, uh, Henry, I just wanted to ask you a very topical question uh, about devolution very briefly. Um, is this something uh, at the time of mayors uh, come, you know, the mayors in this pandemic has, have had a great coverage. They've, you know, there's been some difficulties between some of the mayors and the government, essentially. Um, is the time now ripe for further devolution? What's the view of your organisation? But very briefly, because we've only got a couple of minutes left. No, I'll be very quick. And I think the, the kind of simple answer is they, they should be leading the recovery. And, and that isn't about megaphone diplomacy, which is only the resort you, you take right when you have a mandate to do something, but not the powers or the responsibility and the funding that you need to do the job. And so I think the the challenge for the government is they will have to deal with these individuals, some of whom are Labour, some of them are Conservative, all uh, very uh, driven by what's right for their places. And I think that um, the Chancellor has a big opportunity next week. If you want to get Andy Burnham off the government's back, then give him some work to do, right? Give him the funding and the powers to drive the economic recovery of Greater Manchester. If you want to continue having to deal with him, making the case about why the government's letting down his place and the, the people who live there, then leave him without the resources and the, the tools to do the job he was elected to do. So when, when George Osborne gave the powers to these people, he gave them the job and the first set, it was always the intention that they would get more as they got established. And I think you could certainly not argue that they're not established. Um, and if you compare, for instance, the powers we have around economic development to those available to Wales, which is very important place, but compared to the size of the north of England is a lot smaller, you do see a real disparity in the tools available to do the job. And I think that the tools that are given need to be very much more suited to the task rather than just be what was always the first opportunity of, of a new role. And now those roles are established, they need a lot more powers and a lot more of the tools they need to finish the job that they were elected to do. Very quickly, compared to other countries, um, I understand that we're still one of the most centralised. Um, do you do any work uh, across uh, international borders to look at what, what works elsewhere? Absolutely. And you can look at Germany, right, which is always the example for everything. So it's awful to use it. But the relationship between the German 
states and central government has been very different during this crisis because the powers and responsibilities are more appropriately shared. And so rather than having conflict, you tend to find a lot more consensus because you have people taking the right decisions at the right level. Um, and we can probably bang on for hours, Emma, about subsidiarity and its importance in the UK state. But bluntly, the current way we do politics in this country, it does breed conflict, not just around having a two party system, but disempowering your regions does lead to people in London, the north of England falling out, right? Because the system's forcing us to fight for scarce resources rather than empowering us to have our own destiny in our own hands. And so by not fighting with each other, we're also working against the natural tendencies in our system, which is that there are some, I think, in the Whitehall bubble who quite like the idea of levelling up just being a big bum fight because then they're the people distributing the gains, that makes sense. And I don't want someone in Whitehall to arbiter my fate or the, the fate of the people who live in the north of England. I want us to take our own destiny in our own hands the same way I would want people in Greater London and people in the city to have a lot more power and responsibility over how they drive forward their economies and their places as well. Thank you so much. I think this has been a, a stellar panel, a really interesting uh, debate. As Sir Adrian Montague said in his opening remarks, 2020 has been quite a year. We've had a, an awful, and we still have a global pandemic on our hands. We've had the closing, well, at some point, the closing of the Brexit negotiations and the uh, quite extraordinary US elections. Next year, we've got a new president in the US. Uh, the presidency of the UK presidency of the G7, COP26. We've got elections across the country and local governments, Scottish parliamentary elections. There's lots to do and lots to come. But I think that what we have agreed is that we want to grow the size of the cake as we emerge from this awful pandemic, working together, and that our industry, the financial and related professional services industry, can be at the heart of the solution to this crisis. So thank you to uh, all of our fantastic panellists and thanks for everyone for tuning in.